the crossroads of the Ozarks. Greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, well, Old Testament Bible study (laughs) for Sunday, January 22nd, 2023. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we are delighted that you have chosen to join us here on this beautiful day. Well, foggy. But at least it's not, you know, it's not sleeting or like it was for a while yesterday. I'm grateful. We'll we'll take take that. I am absolutely grateful for that. But you know what? It is January, so that's to be expected. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Well, uh, and thankfully, as I was talking to Mike Kerr the other day, and uh, so they had warmed up to a blistering high of 22 Fahrenheit (laughs) while we were at like 54 degrees. So Mm. I'll take that too. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's relatively mild winters here. We're in in this part of Missouri, we're almost to our Arkansas, so mm-hmm. it's more southerly. Yeah, so we'll after growing up in Chicago, which is called the Windy City for a reason. Mm. Mm, yeah, I'll take because so many talk shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and to Chicago politicians. Oh, I know, I know. And to Deluvian Dodo Birdhead. Yeah. Uh, great Don't quote. even get you started. Yeah, it's great. It's yeah. A Harold good. Washington, Harold former Washington. mayor Harold Washington. That's yeah. right. Referring yeah. to state legislators in Springfield. <clears throat> and to Deluvian Dodo Birdhead state legislators. Mm. It's like, Harold had a way with a phrase. Mm. So. Well, we're still in the Old Testament, and uh, we're sort of crawling our way through as we do. We we try to get as much out of the Word as we possibly can, because there is a lot more packed in there than Derek and I found the first time through. Yeah. So uh, the first time through, we were going through almost twice as quickly as we are. Mm -hmm. We, We found that with this chronological reading order that we had, that if we did two of the recommended readings on a Sunday, that was good. This time through, we're going through one and sometimes not even getting all of that. Sometimes Last week, you we don't did even well. get through a chapter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Depending on. Now, today, we have a lot of names. This right. is literally genealogy. Mm-hmm. This is who had what sons, who had what sons, who had what sons. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, it's, this is, in many ways, this is giving um, that kingly um, lineage. So it tells who has the right to be a priest, who has the right to serve in this capacity, who has the right, who's descended from the kings, for goodness sake. Yeah. Because as we'll see in chapter nine, I think it is eight or nine, that there's a a, a, a mention that all of these are those who had uh, been taken away to Babylon. Right, right. And I did look up the... Uh Books of First and Second Chronicles, which originally was just one book, the chapter divisions, and in right. some cases, the titles of the books were added by later editors and scribes. As were the verses. Yeah. Yeah. They, they did not. The prophets and the apostles did not compose these texts with verse numbers. No. So these were written. The Chronicles were written after the return from Babylon. So sometime after 538 B.C. Mm-hmm. So even though the. The things that are being described here are uh, inserted in the chronological order during the early part of David's reign in Jerusalem. These were written um, probably 400 years later, more than 400 years later. Right. At least. So, so chronological order is the order in which things occurred, mm-hmm. not the order in which they were written. Correct. Yeah. Because if we went in the order they were written, we'd start with the book of Job. Yeah, it will. Because some of Probably, yeah. According to scholars, some of the words in Job are really archaic Hebrew that don't appear anywhere else in the Bible. Yeah, pre-Moses. Yeah. So that, um, but yes, go, going in the order of uh, the events described is how we go through the Bible. And uh, as we're into the life of David, now we've got uh, some Second Samuel still to go. Mm-hmm. We're still in First Chronicles and we got more Psalms yet. So it uh, really helps to uh, really understand the psalms better because you're seeing what's was going on at the time of david's life when those psalms were composed oh i know i so agree with that by the way we may make it to those psalms today that are actually scheduled for next sunday we did that last week Mm -hmm. so yeah well we can gain a little ground that's that's great Mm -hmm. so we'll open with a word of prayer father we thank you for bringing us together over your word and um, just ask you to guide us and grant us wisdom and discernment as we study we know that when we get to sections of the the Bible like this, our temptation is to um, just skip over all of these, but you had them preserved for a reason. So, Lord, let us um, draw what you would have us learn from our study this day, and we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. 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 Speaking of prayer, we just want to really quickly mention oh, yeah. our amazing friend, Dr. Michael Heiser. He uh, posted an update to his health to Facebook. He and, also telephoned um, you and some others. Right. Yeah. Uh, Judd Burton. And um, I know uh, there were others. He probably that, had a whole list of people right. to call. And um, that was that was a, a tough phone call. I was, I was on the phone with Mike mm-hmm. Kerr of Here the Watchman. Um, and I was getting ready to go into Walmart to pick up my new glasses. And um, Mike called and I saw it was Mike Heiser. And we'd not spoken to Mike in a while. We'd not wanted to intrude because if you've not been following, Mike has been, uh, he was diagnosed about 18 months ago with pancreatic cancer. And uh, so Mike Kerr very quickly said, oh, oh, you got to take that. So I picked up, talked to Mike and he was, he was essentially calling to say goodbye. Mm. Yeah. He's gone home to, uh, to be under hospice care Mm -hmm. for the time being. And, uh, you know, unless the Lord brings a miracle, uh, Mike's Which, gonna get to graduate soon. Yes. And, and we direct you to Mike's Facebook page. I'll put a mm-hmm. link to that uh, note in the uh, in the show notes for today's or show notes, study notes for yeah, today's study notes. Uh, for today's program so that you can read it for yourself because I don't want to put words in Mike's mouth. He doesn't need me. <laughs> he doesn't need us no. to put words in his mouth, but we do want to yeah. we have not only um uh, Well, just been honored to be included in his friendship circles, but also we have learned so very much. Most of what you and I do is based on, don't know what that was, most of what you and I do is based on his divine counsel teaching. Mm -hmm. It has been foundational to so many of us. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the the monthly roundtable that I host on my podcast with Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Doug Van Dorn, screenwriter, novelist, Brian Godawa, and Dr. Judd Burton, mm. we freely admit it's really based on what Mike, what we have learned from Mike and his divine counsel research. Uh, Doug's book, Giants, Sons of the Gods, inspired by Mike's work into the divine counsel. Mm-hmm. Brian Godawa's series, The Chronicles of the Nephilim, Chronicles mm-hmm. of the Watchers. Mike, My- Brian has written nonfiction books that basically expand upon what Mike put into the unseen realm. Mike's unseen realm, but also his reversing her mind. Reversing her mind, yes. There's so much in there that you and I have, it just really changed the direction of our research. Direction of our lives, really. Yes, yes. And we were honored to get to go to Israel with Mike. So yeah. if you have not seen our uh, Search for the Titans mm-hmm. DVD from the 2018 Israel tour, and we also went to Sardinia, but Mike didn't go there. Mm-hmm. Um, we he, he gets to they teach. They went to Greece. I know. <laughs> yeah. they uh, He taught from Mount Hermon. We were, yes, and that's part of that uh, video. You can also stream it. It's available at our streaming video site, gilberthouse.org slash video. And uh, yeah, we were on the slope of Mount Hermon with Mike teaching there, which was, and of course, his teaching at the Jordan River on the reason we baptize and why that's connected to this whole uh, Mount Hermon incident was amazing. Wasn't it though? So... Uh, Yeah, pray for Mike, for Drina, his wife, and uh, for their children. Mike is at peace. And again, I direct you to his Facebook post Mm -hmm. because it is beautiful. It is beautiful. As always. Yeah. He is, uh, well, frankly, leading us Mm -hmm. and teaching us. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, and and that's what makes this easier to, uh, to accept, uh, knowing that we know where Mike will be and he knows it, but I will say that, um. Yeah, when I walked into the Walmart to get my glasses, my eyes were red and uh, <clears throat> running. And the lady there, the optician, are, are you okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, yeah. I'm good. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, your prayers for the Heiser family. Much yes, appreciated. very much so. So thank you, Mike. Yeah. I don't know if you ever listen to these things, but uh, we we wouldn't be doing this without you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... In the notes we've exchanged with Tom Horn about this this morning, Mm -hmm. I just can't imagine. Then Tom will say the same thing. I know. Yeah. I know. So giant shoulders. Yes. But, and it will take all of us who have learned from Mike to pick up that mantle Mm because there is no one person you can point to and say, ah, he's the, no, 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 no. Mike has established a legacy. That is for sure. He really has. So thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And now. To First, First Chronicles. Chronicles. We'll pick up with verse, well, chapter 7, verse 1. You and uh, get I get the names. names. 
The sons of Issachar, Tola, Pua, Yashub, and Shimron, four. The sons of Tola, Utsi, Rephaiah. Rephaiah? Yes. Hmm. Oh, yeah. That's uh, got that same... Uh, that name appears later, too. It's based on the same root as Rephaim. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rephaiah, Yariel, Yahmai, Ibsam, and Shemuel, heads of their father's houses, namely of Tola, mighty warriors of their generations, their number in the days of David being 22,600. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. The son of Utsi, Israhiah, and the sons of Israhiah, Michael, Obadiah, Joel, or Yoel, mm-hmm. and Ishiah, all five of them were chief men. And along with them, by their generations, according to their father's houses, were units of the army of war, or army for war, 36,000, for they had many wives and sons. Their kinsmen, belonging to all the clans of Issachar, were in all 87,000 mighty warriors enrolled by genealogy. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Those are just the ones available during the time of David. Yes, and for war, so you yes. would assume men of fighting age. Mm-hmm. The sons of Benjamin, Bela, Becher, and Yedael, three. The sons of Bela, Etzbon, Utsi, Utsiel, Yeramoth, and Eri, five, heads of fathers' houses, mighty warriors. And their enrollment by genealogies was 22,034. The sons of Becher, Zemara, Yoash, Ele- Eleazar, Eleonai, Amri, Yeramoth, Abijah, or Abiyah, probably, Avia, yeah, Avia, Anatoth, and Alameth. Hmm. All of these were the sons of Becher. It says Aviud in the Septuagint. That's probably closer to the pronunciation, mm-hmm. yeah. And their enrollment and uh, and their enrollment by genealogies according to their generations as heads of their father's houses, mighty warriors, was 20,200. The son of Yedael, Bilhan, and the sons of Bilhan, Yeush, Benjamin, Ehud, Kenaiah, Kenaana, that's it, Kenaana, hmm. Zethan, says Kanana. Hmm. Tarshish, and Ahish, Ahish, Ahish Shahar. Tarshish, huh? Ahish Shahar. All these were sons of Yede, Yedeael, Yedeel, according to the heads of their fathers' houses, mighty warriors, 17,200, able to go to war. And Shupim and Hupim were the sons of Ir, Hushim, the son of Ahur. And it, it took me forever to get the pronunciation of uh, Aaron Lipkin's son, Evyatar. Oh, yes. Because it's spelled like the name of David's priest. And we English speakers would look at it and say it's Abi Athar. Mm-hmm. No, it's Evyatar. So... <laughs> I, I am very clumsy with the Hebrew pronunciations. I freely admit that. The sons of Naphtali, Yatziel, Guni, Yetzer, and Shalom, the descendants of Bilha. The sons of Manasseh, Azriel, whom his Aramean concubine bore. Hmm. And that's interesting because we talked with uh, Aaron about the, the existence of Manasseh and Ephraim and their descendants already in the land yeah. when the rest of the tribes of Israel got there under Moses. They they may well have been sent over there as generals or representatives of the Pharaoh. Right, right. During the time of Jacob, mm-hmm. and uh, since Joseph was so honored by the Pharaoh, uh, his sons appear to have had some authority. They were men of some influence in the Nile Delta. Their mother came from the priest hood of on that's correct yes her father was a priest of on so um yeah it, the they were already in the land it appears aaron has done some research on this so uh Azrael, the son of manasseh having an aramean concubine is not surprising what is surprising is that aramean was not uh, th- that's a th- what, what's the word it's not idiosyncratic it's a uh, chronological um uh, it's out, out of sync oh. chronologically. Yeah. Well, um, this is Syrian. Syrian would make sense. Yeah. Aramean would probably be a later term mm-hmm. because the Arameans didn't really emerge on the world stage until about the 11th or 10th century BC. So mm-hmm. about probably five or 600 years after the time of Manasseh, but they probably came from that area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whom his Aramean concubine bore, she bore Machir, the father of Gilead. And Machir took a wife for Hupim and Shupim. The name of his sister was Maka, which is uh, 
the name of a, a town, you know, like on the northern border of Israel, mm-hmm. Avel Beth Ma'aka. And the name of the second was Zelophehad, and Zelophehad had daughters. And Ma'aka, the wife of Machir, bore a son, and she called his name Peresh. And the name of his brother was Sheresh. And his sons were Ulam and Rakim. Rakim. The son of Ulam, Bidan. These were the sons of Gilead, the son of Machir, son of Manasseh. And his sister, oh, <laughs> Hemolaketh. Hmm. There we go. His sister, Hemolaketh, bore Ish- Ishhad, Aviaz- Aviazer, and Mahla. The sons of Shemida were Ahlan, Shechem, Lichi, and Aniam. <clears throat> You're doing a great job. <laughs> We're about halfway through chapter seven. Uh, the sons of Ephraim, Shuthalah and Bered, his son, Tehath, his son, Eliadah, his son, Tehath, his son, Zavad, his son, Shuthalah, his son, and Etzer and Eliad, whom the men of Gath, who were born in the land, killed because they came down to raid their livestock. And Ephraim, their father, mourned many days, and his brothers came to comfort him. And Ephraim went into his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. And he called his name Bariah, because disaster had befallen his house. Um, the name Bariah sounds like the Hebrew word for disaster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of what they did in the day. You know, you wouldn't want to have a child born today and say, you know, disaster has befallen my house. Well, Hello, I- this is my son, Disaster. But back then, the names meant something. They That's did. why right. all of these names, if you, if you wanted to just spend a month just going through First Chronicles and, and digging into the names. The meaning of the names, yeah. right. Today, it, we, we name children oftentimes based on the sound. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, my mom and dad, you know, mom liked the name Derek. And, uh, it means the way. It means the way in Hebrew. But uh-huh. uh, she was looking more at the Germanic meaning, which is ruler. Mm-hmm. And that's not why she named me that. Um, <laughs> Dad always joked it was because John Derrick played Joshua in the Ten Commandments. So. I think that's probably it. <laughs> anyway, uh, his daughter was Sheira, who built both Lower, lower and Upper Beth Horan. Uh, those are towns on the southern border of the territory belonging to Ephraim. And Uzen Sheira. Repha, he was his son. See, there's another one. Yes, that is also based on that root from which we get uh, Rephaim. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Reshef, his son. Uh-huh. Reshef was the name of the uh, plague god called Apollo by the Greeks and Romans. Mm-hmm. Tela, his son. Tehan, his son. Ledan, his son. Amihud, his son. Elishama, his son. Nun, his son. Joshua, his son. Yes, that Joshua. Their possessions and settlements. John Derek. Yeah, John Derrick, were Bethel and its towns, and to the east, Naaran, and to the west, Getzer and its towns, Shechem and its towns, and Ayah and its towns, also in possession of the Manassites, Beth Shean and its towns, Ta'anach and its towns, Megiddo and its towns. I'm just going to finish this sentence right I know. I, I just want to, before I forget, okay. so as soon as you're done with the sentence. Dor and its towns, and these live the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. I had my hand up. Yes, Mrs. Uh, G. Back in verse 25, yes. in the Septuagint, it says, backing up to the, the sent, beginning of the sentence, and the descendants of Otsan were Shera and Rapha, his son, mm-hmm. Saraf. Oh, as, as in the singular Thales. form of seraphim, instead yes. of reshef. Verse 25, middle of the screen. I see that, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Seraph and Thales, his sons. And that's really interesting, too, because Thales is a very well-known early Greek philosopher mm. called the father of the scientific method. Hmm. Yeah. Probably a more popular name when the Septuagint translators were translating because of the Greek influence. That's very possible, yes. But why Seraph? Why Seraph instead of Reshef? That is really... No, no, Reshef is in... Oh, yes, instead of Reshef. Yeah. Yeah, that, so we've got Rafa mm-hmm. and Seraph. Very interesting. Yeah. So anyway, sorry about that. Just, no. Well, it's I, like naming a kid Apollo. You know, today we wouldn't think anything of it. But back in the day, when you were naming your child for a deity, mm-hmm. especially if you're an Israelite, why would you name your child for a pagan deity. You don't think Apollo Creed back in the uh, the, <laughs> the movie days, 
Rocky, mm-hmm. Apollo Creed, Apollo, obviously. Yep. Creed just means belief. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And now the descendants of Asher, the sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Bariah, and their sister Sarah. Another Bariah. Mm-hmm. And Ishvi was the uh, was the name of the one of the de- descendants of the giant is how it's translated in Second Samuel twenty one. But uh, member of that uh, warrior cult that worshipped the Rephaim, Ishvi ben Ov. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ishvi Bariah and their sister Sarah, the sons of Bariah, Heber, well Heber probably, and Malkiel who fathered Ber- Berziath. Heber fathered Yaphlet. Shomer, Hotham, and their sister Shua, the sons of Yaphlet, Pesach, Bimhal, and Ashvath. These are the sons of Yaphlet. The sons of Shemer, his brother, Roka, Yahuva, and Aram. The sons of Helem, his brother. Oh, here is left out. Hmm. Okay. Just double checking. No, I didn't skip one. So, hmm. Now it's in the Septuagint. Huh. The sons of Helem, his brother, Zophah, Imna, Shelesh, and Amal. The sons of Zophah, Sua, Harnefer, Shual, Beri, Imra. Verse 36 in the Septuagint, I mentioned this to you this morning. It says the sons of Zophah, Shue, but it's spelled S-U-E. So it was a boy mm. named Sue. <laughs> <laughs> he was tough, though. Yeah, don't mess with him. No. The sons of Ula, or rather the sons of Yether, Yafuna, Pispa, and Ara. Uh, verse 39, the sons of Ula, Ara, Haniel, and Reziah. All of these were men of Asher, heads of father's houses, approved mighty warriors, chiefs of the princes. Their number enrolled by genealogies for service in war was 26,000 men. And now chapter 8, a genealogy of Saul. Hmm. Benjamin fathered Bela, his firstborn, Ashval the second, Ahara, Ahara the third, Noha the fourth, and Rapha the fifth. Mm-hmm. And Bela had sons, Adar, Gera, Avihud, Avishua, Naaman, Ahoa, Gera, Shephufan, and Huram. And these are the sons of Ehud. They were heads of fathers' houses of the inhabitants of Geva, and they were carried into exile to Manahat. Where is Manahat? Um, hmm. Don't know. Hmm. Naaman, Ahijah, or Ahia, and Gera, that is Heglam, who fathered Utza and Ahihud, and Shaharaim, Shaharaim fathered sons in the country of Moab after he had sent away Hushim and Baara, his wives. He fathered sons by Hodesh, his wife, Yovav, Zivia, Misha, Malcolm, Yutz, uh, Sha. Sakha and Mirma. These were his sons, heads of fathers' houses. He also fathered sons by Hushim, Havitud, uh, sorry, Havituv, and El Paal. El Paal. The sons of El Paal, Ever, Misham, and Shemed, who built Ono, not Yoko, but who built Ono, and Lod, with its towns, and Veraya and Shema, they were the heads of fathers' houses and the inhabitants of Ayalon, who caused the inhabitants of Gath to flee. Now, sometimes I wonder if these parentheses are additions. Could be. Could be. I'm reading a quick note here in the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary about that uh, Manahath. Mm-hmm. And uh, in verse 7, where it says, Naaman, Ahijah, and Gera, that is Heglam, who fathered Utsa and Ahihud. Uh, alternate translation that Heglam um, may be a verb, hmm. not a proper name. And it means that this, uh, that this Gera carried um, these other people into exile. Oh. Or exiled them. Exiled them would make more sense. Yeah, this exile may be understood within the context of Benjaminite colonization of the mountains of Gilead before the monarchy, so before Saul became king. Right. Yeah, the Benjaminite clan of Ehud, whose father was Gera, settled near the modern town of uh, Ajun. So Manahath would be in that area. This would be, 
um, well, north of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's (laughs) getting into a deep dive study there. But uh, yeah, apparently the uh, the the scholars who looked into that suggest that uh, perhaps there's another way of understanding it that this Mm. um, exile was not the exile imposed by the Babylonians. Huh. So I'll take 13 again. And Veraya and Shema, they were the heads of father's houses of the inhabitants of Ayalon, who caused the inhabitants of Gath to flee. Hmm. Or exiled them. Mm-hmm. And Ahio, Shashak, and Yeremot, Zavadiah, Arad, Eder, Michael, Ishpa, Ishpa and Yohad were sons of Veraya. Yavadiah, or Jebediah, as we would usually say it, anglicize it, Meshulam, Itzki, Hever, Ishmerai, Ishmerai, Itzki, yeah, that's an I, Hever, Ishmerai, Itzliya, there are two Ishmerais somewhere along the line, mm-hmm. and Yovav were the sons of El Paul. I always want to say Joe Bob. Yeah, <laughs> J-O-B-A-B, mm. here in the U.S., Joe Bob, yeah. Um, Yakim Zikri Zavdi Elianai Zile Tai Eliel. I'm so bad at this. Adaya, Veraya, and Shimrat were the sons of Shimei. Ishpan, Ever, Eliel, Abdon, Zikri, Hanan, Hananiah, Elam, Anatotia, Ifteai, and Penuel were the sons of Shashak. Shamsharai, Shaharaya, Al. Ataliah, Yashia, Elia, Elijah, mm-hmm. and Zikri were the sons of Yeroham. These were the heads of fathers' houses according to their generations, chief men. These lived in Jerusalem. Yael, the father of Gibeon, lived in Gibeon, and the name of his wife was Makah. His firstborn son, Avdon, then Sur, Kish, Baal, Baal, mm-hmm. Nadav, Gedor, Ahio, Zeker, and Mikloth, the fa- who fathered Shimea. Now, these also lived opposite their kinsmen in Jerusalem with their kinsmen. There was the father of Kish, Kish of Shaul, or Saul, mm-hmm. Saul of Yonatan, or Jonathan, uh, Malkishua, Avinadav, and Eshbaal. Eshbaal. Yeah, yeah Eshbosheth. Yes. Yeah. And the son of Yonatan or Jonathan and Merif Baal. Merif Baal. What what does that one mean? Um well, let's see. Something the Lord, you know, something is the Lord. What right. does it mean? Uh Merib or well, contend with Baal. Huh. Or, ba- or Baal contends. Yeah. Merif Baal and Merif Baal was the father of Micah or Micah. The sons of Micah, Michal, Biton, Melech, Melech. Yeah. King, yeah. Tarea uh-huh. and Ahaz. Ahaz fathered Yedo, Yehudah, and Yehudah fathered Alemet, Atzmavet, and Zimri. Zimri fathered Moza, Moza fathered Binea, Rafa, there is that name, was his son, Eliasa, his son, Atzel, his son. Atzel had six sons, and these are their names Atz, Atzrikam, Bocheru, Ishmael, Sheriai, Obadiah, is that the prophet Obadiah? Uh, I don't know. And Hanan, all these were the sons of Atzel, the sons of Heshek, his brother, Ulam, his firstborn, Yeush the second, and Eliphelet the third. The sons of Ulam were men who were mighty warriors, bowmen, having many sons and grandsons. All these were Benjaminites. Let's see, just checking very quickly. Again, the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, a great resource. But, um, mm-hmm. And you can get a free resource of that. The anchor? No, not oh, the anchor. Can't? No. Oh, for no, some I've, reason I've got I that. thought I'd found anchor things without paying for it. Um, you might have, but not this particular uh, dictionary. Okay. This, this one is. Th- this That's was your part secret of one. Last year's no, no. This was last year's part of last year's Christmas gift when I bought all those extra resources. Oh, I know. For That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. your secret one. <laughs> yeah. Um. Hmm. hmm. Don't know if that's the same Obadiah. It's a fairly common name. Yes, it in, is. In the, the Bible. So, um, First Chronicles 9. My question, 9. since we just did Benjamin. Yes. I wonder if somewhere down the line, if some of the Benjaminites sort of said, you know, David kind of stole the kingship. 
we're descended from Saul. Why aren't we kings? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Guess we'll find out. This, uh, by the way, this Marib Baal is um, in 2 Samuel 4, verse 4, was Mephibosheth. Mm-hmm. So he was the, the one who had uh, was lame in his feet. Right. And um, David protected him. Mm-hmm. So uh, Ishbosheth or Eshbaal, who you mentioned there, that was the one who set up a kingdom following the uh, deposition of Saul. Well, we, we went into that in a previous study. Mm-hmm. There were seven years where David was ruling at the same time as Eshbaal, but he was over across mm-hmm. the, uh, the river. And I forget the name of the town starts with a P. But anyway, uh, yeah, civil war between the tribes, essentially, until Abner finally said, okay, that's it. Because Esh- Ish-bosheth or Ish- Eshbal mm-hmm. accused Abner of spying for David. Yes, that's yeah. right. First Chronicles 9. So all Israel was recorded in genealogies, and these are written in the book of the kings of Israel. Another book mentioned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And Judah was taken into exile in Babylon because of their breach of faith. Okay. In the Septuagint, this is the way it's punctuated. And this is all Israel, even their enrollment. And these are written down in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, comma, with the names of them that were carried away to Babylon for their transgressions. Hmm. Is yours punctuated differently? Because it sounded like you were saying, and Judah carried away to... Yes, The book of the kings of Israel, period. That's interesting. Then it goes into and Judah. Oh, okay. Oh, punctuation makes a difference. It does. And the different, and yeah, they kind of had to guess on that because of the. uh, It's not perfectly clear. There are diacritical markings, but it's tough to tell. You don't even have vowels in most of them. Right. Yeah, in the original Hebrew, you didn't get vowels or punctuation. Right. So, it was later on that it was mm-hmm. sort of added with little marks. Right. We need to know where one sentence ends and the other begins. Yeah. So the Septuagint just puts a comma there. The Masoretic text appears to put a period there. Hmm. Interesting. Because, yeah, the Net Bible translates it the same way. They are recorded in the scroll of the kings of Israel, period. Next sentence. The people of Judah were carried away to Babylon. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But Israel were also carried away. They were carried away by Assyria, though. Well, that's true, but they were ground. Well, about yeah. 140 years earlier. Yeah, that's a uh, good point. Verse 2, now the first to dwell again in their possessions in their cities were Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the temple servants. And some of the people of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh lived in Jerusalem. And, uh, yeah. It says lived in Jerusalem? Uh-huh. Oh, oh yeah, it's just worded differently. Go ahead. Okay. Now I'm going to repeat this again because this is significant. Verse two. Now the first to dwell again in their possessions in their cities were Israel, meaning apparently the northern tribes, the northern kingdom. This says in the cities of Israel. Hmm. All right. Net Bible, what do you say? This says, and they that dwelt before in the possess- in their possessions in the cities of Israel, yeah. the priests, the Levites, and the appointed ones. New English translation reads, the first to resettle on their property and in their cities were some Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants. Huh. And, uh, yeah, the Hebrew literally, and again, this is why we love the Net Bible, they, sh- they share translators' notes. The Hebrew literally reads, quote, and the inhabitants, the first who... In their property, in their cities, they insert the word were, the first who were in their property, in their cities, comma, Israel, comma, the priests, comma, and the temple servants. Comma, comma, comma. (laughs) Uh, No, I I just want to mention, if you're brand new to the study, I always follow along in the Septuagint. I use the Brenton translation because it's free. Mm -hmm. The reason we love that is because the Septuagint Uh, translators used manuscripts no longer available to us. All we have are various Greek versions, their translation from Hebrew into Greek, which is the tongue of the day. And uh, uh, they used a manuscript, again, not available to us. It wasn't until 1,000, 1,200 years later that the Masoretic text was put together. So it's possible that the Septuagint actually gets it right. They were closer to the event, and Mm -hmm. they also had a uh, a better understanding of the context yeah right and a better under better understanding of the hebrew right right because so, it's very old hebrew yeah 
Having to make the text larger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome to my world. The new glasses are fine. It's just my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. 61-year-old eyes. Yeah, it's okay. My eyes adore you. <laughs> Back at you. Uh. Um, but the reason I stopped and wanted to reread 9 verse 2 and then 9 3 again, the first to resettle. Um, what what does your, the, the newer, the Lexum The Lexum of- says... Pretty much the same thing that you said. The, uh, the ones who dwelled before in their possessions in the cities, colon, Israel, comma, the Levite sons, comma, the priests, comma, and the appointed ones. That's interesting because they've changed it because this, this says in the cities of Israel. Yeah. This, uh, again, the ESV reads, uh, now the first to dwell again in their possessions in their cities were Israel, comma, the priests, mm-hmm. comma, the Levites and the temple servants. And then verse three, and some of the people of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh lived in Jerusalem. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because we've got this idea that the 10 tribes of Israel, the northern tribes, were all lost. Right. This is why I'm trying to make sure that yes. we get this down. Mm-hmm. The the uh, theory of the, the missing tribes, the, the lost tribes of Israel, is, is really a myth. They weren't lost. Mm-hmm. We can see right here that when they came back from Babylon, they knew. And because they kept all these genealogies, they mm-hmm. knew who was in which tribes. And when they got back there, they said, okay, Israel, that would be referring to the northern tribes. Right. Of which Ephraim is sort of uh, used as a, a name, Ephraim or Israel, the northern tribe, uh, northern kingdom rather. And then the southern kingdom of Judah. But in amongst the people of Judah, you've got people from Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh. You've mm-hmm. also got Levites. We know who those are. Right. So the 10... Lost tribes are not lost. Right. Going back to verse 1, where it says uh, these things are written down in the book of the kings of Israel, and of course this says, and Judah, comma. Uh, the point is that this may be what we call First and Second Kings, mm-hmm. but it also could be another book that we've simply lost access to. Yeah. Uh, according to Faith Life Study Bible, the chronicle re- chronicler, that is whoever wrote First and Second Chronicles, refers to this book several times, also mentioned in Second Chronicles mm-hmm. 7 or 27 rather 27 verse 7 and there it is in fact said book of the kings of israel and judah ah and also in chron- uh second chronicles 35 27 the book of the kings of israel and judah Ha-ha. so yes Comma. <laughs> exclamation point uh. um So verse three, verse three again, and some of the people of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim and Manasseh lived in Jerusalem. Uthai, the son of Amihud, son of Amri, son of Imri, son of Bani, from the sons of Perez, the son of Judah. And of the Shilonites, Azahiah, the firstborn and his sons, of the sons of Zerah, Yeuel and their kinsmen, 690. Of the Benjaminites, Salu, the son of Meshulam, son of Hodaviah, son of Hasanua, Ivaniah, the son of Yeroham, Elah, the son of Utsi, son of Michri, and Meshulam, the son of Shephatiah, son of Reuel, son of Iv- Ivnijah, and their kinsmen, according to their generations, 956. All these were heads of fathers' houses, according to their fathers' houses. Of the priests, Yedaiah, Yehoreb, Yakin, and Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, son of Meshulam, son of Zedak, son of Merioth, son of Ahitub, the chief officer of the house of God, mm. and Adaiah, the son of Yeroham, Yeroham, son of Pashur, son of Malkiah, and Maasai, the son of Adiel, son of Yezerah. Yes? Oh, stop. You got to go back to verse 11. The ruler of the house of God? Chief officer? Yes. Yeah. This says the ruler, but the chief officer of the house of God. Is this the person who is most senior in the temple in the tabernacle um because there would have been a tabernacle at that time yeah or is it something else as in bethel or something no i'm because we're talking about zadok there and Mm -hmm. uh let's see what verse was uh, that again i'm sorry 11 10 Um, and 11 zadok son of marioth son of ahitub okay hello ahitub where is that it looks to me like they're referring to these priests and Azariah, who is the son of all of these. And so either Azariah was the ruler or Ahitov, the last one who's named. Ahitov was a Levitical priest, father of Ahijah and Ahimelech, 
grandfather of Eviatar, who we mentioned uh, earlier. Yeah. Well, not our Eviatar. No, not but Eviatar, the uh, priest in Shiloh. Ah, okay. The one who David went to, I think. Right. And okay. Yeah, Ahishah was a priest to Saul in Shiloh, served the same king at Gibeah, and perished when Doeg the Edomite massacred the priesthood at Nob. N-O-B, or Nov, actually, Nov. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ahimelech's son, Eviatar, escaped to serve David as his chaplain during his outlaw period. So Eviatar was David's priest when David was on the run. That's what I thought. Okay. But uh, yeah, it, uh, you get to a certain age committing all this stuff to memory. Just not happening. So that's, I'm just that's grateful who, I remember my name each morning. <laughs> so th- that's who we're dealing with. That line uh, that traced, the and again, being returned exiles, these are people who are coming back in the late 6th century, 400 years, mm-hmm. more than 400 years after the time of David. And they could trace their genealogy back to, yes, mm-hmm. I descend from the guy who served David, whose grandfather, you know, father and grandfather served Saul right. at Shiloh. And I'm sure today there are genealogies that are listed and being um, perused and uh, picked apart as regards to the Temple Institute, figuring mm-hmm. out who would be in charge of what in the temple if yeah. it is ever you know, rebuilt. They are identifying. It doesn't need to be rebuilt as far as I'm concerned. No, that's because, correct. Uh, the Lord, he, he, uh, he replaced that. Mm-hmm. But they are identifying and um, using DNA to do it in some cases, yeah, who is qualified to serve mm-hmm. in the temple. Um, let's go back to verse 4 again. Uthai, the son of Amihud, the son of Omri, son of four? Imri. Uh, okay, you're, you're verse, down ten, verse 10. And okay, verse 10. Of the priests, Yedaiah, Yehorib, Yakin, and Azar- Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, son of Meshulam, son of Zadok, Son of Marioth, son of Ahitub, the chief officer of the house of God. Yeah, hey, did you have to read all of that stuff again if you and didn't need to? Probably people out there were shouting. <laughs> <laughs> no! Wait, not again. <laughs> and Adaiah, the son of Yehoam, son of Pashur, son of Melchiah, and Maasai, the son of Adiel, the son of Yazerah, son of Meshulam, the son of Meshilamith, son of Immer. Besides their kinsmen, heads of their father's houses, 1,760 mighty men for the work of the service of the house of God. Of the Levites, Shemaiah, the son of Hashub, son of Azrikam, the son of Hashabiah, of the sons of Merari, and Bakbakar, Heresh, Galal, and Mataniah, the son of Micah, son of Zichri, the son of Asaph, and Obadiah, the son of Shemaiah, son of Galal, son of Yeduthun, and Berakiah, the son of Asa, son of Elkanah, who lived in the villages of the Natophathites. The gatekeepers were Shalom, Akub, Talman, Achiman, and their kinsmen. Shalom was the chief. Until then, they were in the king's gate on the east side as the gatekeepers of the camps of the Levites. Shalom, the son of Kore, son of Eviasaph, son of Korah, and his kinsmen of his father's house, the Korahites, were in charge of the work of the service, keepers of the thresholds of the tent, as their fathers had been in charge of the camp of Yahweh, keepers of the entrance. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, was the chief officer over them in time past. Yahweh was with him. He was the one who stabbed the young Israelite man and Midianite princess on the Mm -hmm. plains of Moab. Zechariah, the son of Meshelamiah, was gatekeeper at the entrance of the tent of meeting. All these who were chosen as gatekeepers at the thresholds were 212. That's an important job. Yes. Thresholds. Yes, yeah. it is. Gatekeepers. They were enrolled by genealogies in their village. Villages. David and Samuel the seer established them, established them in their office of trust. So they and their sons were in charge of the gates of the house of Yahweh, that is, the house of the tent, as guards. The gatekeepers were on the four sides, east, west, north, and south. And their kinsmen, who were in their villages, were obligated to come in every seven days in turn to be with these, for the four chief gatekeepers, who were Levites, were entrusted to be over the chambers and the treasures of the house of God. And they lodged around the house of God, for on them lay the duty of watching, and they had charge of opening it every morning. Some of them had charge of the utensils of service, for they were required to count them when they were brought in and taken out. Others of them were appointed over the furniture and over the holy utensils, also over the fine flour, the wine, the oil, the incense, and the spices. 
Others of the sons of the priests prepared the mixing of the spices, and Mattathiah, one of the Levites, the firstborn of Shalom the Korahite, was entrusted with making the flat cakes. Also, some of their kinsmen of the hmm. Kohathites... This says was, in tr- was set in charge over the sacrifices of meat offering of the pan belonging to the high priest. Huh. It could be cakes because meat yeah. is a sort of a generic term right. in uh, antiquity. But yeah, different. Hmm. Um, yeah. Meat in, in, offering of the pan. Yeah, the, the newer Septuagint translation, the uh, Lexham. Uh, charge over the affairs of the sacrifices of the pan. Mm. He was chief of the pancake offerings. I love that. <laughs> also, some of their kinsmen of the Kohathites had charge of the showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. Now these, the singers, the heads of fathers' houses of the Levites, were in the chambers of the temple free from other service, for they were on duty day and night. These were heads of fathers' houses of the Levites, according to their generations, leaders. These lived in Jerusalem. Now we repeat Saul's genealogy again. In Gibeon lived the father of Gibeon, Yeel, and the name of his wife was Maaka, and his firstborn son, Avdon, then Zer, Kish, Baal, Ner, Nadav, Gedor, Ahio, Zechariah, and Mikloth. And Mikloth was the father of Shimeon. And these also lived opposite their kinsmen in Jerusalem with their kinsmen. Ner fathered Kish. Kish fathered Saul. Saul fathered Jonathan, Malkishua, Avinadav, Avinadav and Eshbaal, Eshbaal. And the son of Jonathan was Meriv Baal, or Mephibosheth. And Meriv Baal fathered Micah. The sons of Micah, Pithon, Melech, Tariah, and Ahaz. And Ahaz fathered Yarah, and Yarah fathered Elameth. Asmaveth, and Zimri. And Zimri fathered Mozah. Mozah fathered Benaiah and Rephaiah, his son. Who's that Yes. Eliash, Eliasa, Eliasa, his son. Azel, his son. Azel had six sons, and these are their names. Azrakam, Bokeru, Ishmael, Sheariah, Obadiah, and Hanan. These were the sons of Azel. So go to Psalm 102. Uh, no, First Chronicles 10. Oh, it's 2.10, sorry. Yep. Well, let me go back. Defer, defer <laughs> to the chronicler. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, First Chronicles 10. The death of Saul and his sons. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain at Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadav and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and mistreat me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died. Thus Saul died, he and his three sons and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley valley saw that the army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. Hmm. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Geboah. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to their idols and to the people. Now you think that the idols, the deities inside of them, would know. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't think you'd have to go and tell them. Verse 10, And they put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. But when all Javash Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh. And they buried their bones 
under the oak in Jabesh and fastened and fasted seven days. The oak in Jabesh mm-hmm. buried them under that. Yeah. Now, Sacred does that mean that tree. there was a cave underneath that? Or a cave close to it? Because generally they put them in caves. Um, that's a good question. I don't think so. I think they, they, it was just a, a th- buried him near a, a sacred tree, like a ter- right. the oak or terebinth, same, same thing. Yeah. Now, in Israel, there are, when we think of caves, we think of, okay, we're looking at the side of a rock and there's a big opening. Sometimes there's a bear inside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but sometimes there are a lot of those in Israel, but also there are some that are just hole in the ground. And it's an opening in the rock, and it looks like nothing, but when you crawl down in there, it's a big opening. And some have buried their mm. loved ones in right, those. Right, right. Uh, 13, so Saul died for his breach of faith. Mm. He broke faith with Yahweh in that he did not keep the command of Yahweh and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He visited an oath. Mm-hmm, right. He wanted the fallen realm to bring up S- Samuel so he could talk to him. Mm-hmm. He wanted information mm-hmm. from the dead, which was forbidden. That is forbidden. Verse 14, he did not seek guidance from Yahweh. Therefore, Yahweh put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. And that was an easy one to read. <laughs> yeah, Yavesh Gilead is uh, east of the Jordan River, by the way. So these guys from Yavesh Gilead crossed the river mm-hmm. and got, you know, Mount Gilboa is about mm, 18 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee. It's in the Jezreel Valley, which would have been a real prize for the Philistines because that's prime farmland in, oh, uh, yeah. in Israel. It's, it kind of looks like the American Midwest almost. Um. So, yeah, a... Uh, Only not nearly as big. No, but um, certainly a, a, an area that's been fought over for thousands mm-hmm. of years. So we'll go to Psalm 102 now as we uh, continue our chronological reading of the, um, uh, of the, uh, the, the scriptures here. Psalm 102, a prayer of one afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before Yahweh. Hear my prayer, O Yahweh. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and is withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. I am like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl. What of verse the, are you on? That's verse 6. So different in here, okay. Yeah, like an owl of the waste places, and uh, that words translated owl there are really not... Uh, this says pelican. I yeah. know, makes no sense. Yeah. It, uh, kos in Hebrew. Kos? Not like kos oh, or okay. kaos. Okay. Yeah, the national deity of Edom mm. was uh, kaos, but... Uh, well, maybe it's a similar word, though. Uh, it might be. You'd have to do a study on it, yeah. but it, they're using different letters to transliterate it. Right. So, uh, I lie awake. I am like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All the day my enemies taunt me. For those who deride me, use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink because of your indignation and anger. Take that again. Because of your indignation and anger, for you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O Yahweh, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. Mm. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Nations will fear the name of Yahweh, and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For Yahweh builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise Yahweh, that he looked down from his holy height, from heaven 
Yahweh looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may be that they may declare in Zion the name of Yahweh, and in Jerusalem his praise, when peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship Yahweh. He has broken my strength in mid-course. He has shortened my days. O my God, I say, take me not away from the midst of my days. You whose years endure throughout all generations, of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants should dwell, shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. What a remarkable psalm. Yeah, these uh, 102, 103, 104, these are all extremely poetic and prophetic yeah and prophetic there's so much in there good grief you could write entire books on this mm-hmm. um well we're getting close to an hour so if you want to do one more we can or we can hold off and let's do hold these. off yeah because these are uh, thematically connected they're so so good yeah and one of the things that that is in here that is definitely prophetic is not only that the name would be spoken and praised in jerusalem right but also hashem that is yeshua Mm -hmm. but also the idea that the earth itself would grow old and wax away yes wax old and 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 uh that it would be he would put on another garment as if putting on a new earth that's exactly what we're told will happen. Yeah. And I, I love this. Um, what was this back in verse, uh, verse 12 and 13. Verse 13. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. I know. And that appointed time is something that all generations have looked forward to. You and I, we still look forward to that. I think it's very likely that we are living in that time. Yeah. The appointed time has come. Mm-hmm. We're getting very close. Things are changing so rapidly in this uh, this world. We just look back just where we were 10 years ago, for example. I know. Not just us personally, but, but the, the, the world country, in general. The world. In 10 years, mm-hmm. it, it's very much like the Trump administration that that time period catalyzed something new Mm -hmm. and it's not a good something new no no it flushed a lot of (laughs) flushed a lot of varmints out of hiding yeah yeah but they were always there and they were always working always been behind the scenes and now they're they've come forward as if they're proud of their Mm -hmm. their beliefs yeah because they're and i use the word belief intentionally because whether or not a person says he or she is agnostic or atheist or, or pagan or whatever, if that person does not believe in the God of the Bible, does not believe in, in Yeshua, then they've got a ways to go. Mm-hmm. But at least start with believing the Bible. Most people don't believe There are many people in church that don't believe it. Correct. Correct. And... Taking a stand on God's definition of righteousness, the family, mm, life, life can really get you into trouble. I don't know if you've been following what's happened to um, Hall of Fame NFL coach Tony Dungy. He's the one who coached the mm-hmm. the Colts to their Super Bowl win over oh yeah Dub Bears. Yeah, um, he's caught all kinds of grief this past week. He made a comment about, um, well, uh, he commented on the, the transgender movement. Mm-hmm. And he his comments were based on his Christian faith. And uh, so there's all kinds of hue and cry to uh, deplatform him. NBC Sports should fire him. And then he spoke at the March for Life in Washington, D.C. yesterday. And he brought up the uh, the Buffalo Bills player who collapsed on the field in the game against Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Uh, heart just stopped right there on the field. He, right now, he got he got hit right smack on the chest with the uh, the receiver's helmet, caught and him right smack in the chest. Has been known to stop your heart. Right, catch it at just the right moment, and that will uh, uh, that will happen. But thankfully, and this uh, Bills player who's 
sadly I'm, I'm forgetting his name, but he is also a man of faith. And, yes, he is very openly. Yeah. And, uh, Dungey, coach Dungey talked about the power of prayer at the March for life. And this sent people into even more of a fury because a, he's challenging the, uh, the world's definition, the definition of the God of this age, the spirit of the age, Inanna, mm-hmm. on uh, gender roles, but also then daring to challenge... Damar Hamlin? Damar Hamlin, that's it, thank you. Um, daring to challenge the uh, the power of Molech to claim our children. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm doing a presentation for an upcoming virtual conference for Hear the Watchmen. I'm going to try to record that this evening and uh, get it off to Mike Kerr. Um, which is why I was talking to him on Friday. And it is on the cult of Molech. Now, there is no official organized cult of Molech with rites and rituals, but... That we know of. That we know of, right. If if there is, they're being very quiet about it. But when you look at the influence of this entity on the world today, and if you've not read my book, The Second Coming of Saturn, I show in there from ancient texts why Molech was the god the Canaanites called El, the god that the... Romans called Saturn, the Greeks called Kronos, well known for child sacrifice in those cultures, Baal, Haman of the Phoenicians likewise. Um, so not a surprise that we're seeing children being sacrificed today. It may not be done in a ritual with signs and sigils on the walls inside the uh, the clinics where it takes place, but the number one cause of death worldwide for the fourth year in a row is, um, is abortion. Mm. And the numbers are even much higher than I thought. In my book, I put I quoted the uh, number for 2021, which according to Worldometers is, um, and that's drawn from statistics taken from the World Health Organization, 42 million. Uh, for 2022, the number's over 44 million, but the World Health Organization's own website claims that there are 73 million annually, worldwide. 73 million million. And where do they get that number if they're giving the other number of 42 million or whatever it was? Don't know, but that's that's at the World Health Organization's website. And of course, since they call it an essential health service, those Mm -hmm. 73 million children who were not delivered full term, they're not counted as deaths. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's how they can go out there and say, no, no, heart disease, that's the number one cause of death worldwide. Well, that's like 8 million. Cancer, like, you know, Five million. Do you know what the number one cause of death is? Being a human. Well, yeah. Because death entered the world through humans. Mm-hmm. And it will continue so until yeah. the Lord changes things. But those who speak out like Coach Dungey uh, for a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview, are mm-hmm. going to catch all kinds of flack. Mm-hmm. And there are certain hot button issues. And I think they're related to these spirits. Yes. This spirit of Saturn, Molech, whatever you want to call them. The spirit of Inanna. Mm-hmm regarding our roles. God created men and women with different roles, but complementary roles. Yes. And if we live them correctly, according to uh, Ephesians 5, things, (laughs) life is really sweet. Yes. (laughs) Men shouldn't be trying to be women. Women should not be trying to be men. And that doesn't mean men never push the vacuum cleaner. That's not what I'm saying. But there are roles that are defined in scripture mm-hmm. for men and for women. And when somebody like a Tony Dungy, who's got a big platform, tougher to cancel because, yeah, first black coach to win the Super Bowl mm-hmm. and uh, well respected and regarded by his peers says something like this. Boy, you know, he stirs up a hornet's nest, but it's a little tougher to cancel him than it would be to cancel somebody like you or me. Who are we? I mean, you know. Well, pray for Tony Dungy. Yes. Um, And for him, for him having the courage to speak out. Yes. Yeah. Now, I I did see, and I've not read all the stories on this. I did see a headline saying that he apologized for some of his comments. I don't know what the comments were. All I know is that he he expressed an opinion that riled up the the people who follow the gods Mm -hmm. of this world. It's not going to last much longer. Uh -uh. This is not going to be the way the world goes for the next million years. The Lord is coming back. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we study end times prophecy, Mm -hmm. because that's where all of this leads. We are not a millennial. We are not already living in the millennial reign. The millennial reign is not just Mm -hmm. a metaphor. It is a literal time when Jesus will return, put things right and rule from his holy mountain, Zion, 
But even during that thousand year period, there will be people who come of age and decide he's a tyrant. He's telling us what we're supposed to do. How dare he? What gives him the right to do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> As he said to Joe, where were you and I? Yeah. Laid the foundations of the universe. Well, he gave each one of us free will. Yep. And that means we can choose wisely or foolishly. Mm -hmm. Well, shifting gears. Shifting we, gears. We will be in um, Blue Eye, that is uh, Morningside, on Thursday, February 2nd. Remember, Groundhog Day. We'll be there on Groundhog Day. Yes, Jim Baker Show on Groundhog Day. It's in Blue Eye, Missouri. Um, big signs to get into Mor Morningside. Blue Eye is a teeny, teeny little town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little south and uh, west of Branson. So if you're in the Ozarks, in that area, the... Uh, Recording session is free and open to the public. It uh, opens, doors open at 11. We'll probably start around noon. I think op they open a little before then, but yeah. Probably, yeah. And they say 11 a.m., but we usually don't get out there until about noon. But no. they get there a little early. They've got a wonderful little cafe there. They do. And you'll want to eat because the recording sessions kind of go a couple of hours. So. Yeah. So we'll be there talking about the Great Reset and... Uh, the greater reset, yes. which is when God comes back and says, Amen. that's it. That's all the things, one I look forward to. Behold, here. I am making all things new. Yes. That's the reset that we're looking forward to. Yes. Amen to that. Um, VFTV tonight, do you have one of those? Yes. It is another Iron and Myth mm. discussion. Uh, Pastor Doug Van Dorn, Brian Gadawa, Dr. Judd Burton join me and we discuss demons. What are they? Are they different from fallen angels? If so, how? Oh, hierarchy talk. Yes. Are there different kinds of demons? We didn't even get... We thought, okay, we can do all of this and fallen angels in one show. And then it's no. like, mm, no, we might need to do a demons part two and then get to the fallen angels after mm -hmm. that because it's a, a bigger topic than yeah, we thought. Kind of that. We didn't even get to the, the, the discussion of why there's so much demonic activity discussed in the New Testament and you don't see a single example of an Old Testament prophet casting out a demon. That's interesting. No, you don't. There's a hint at it. Where David playing his lyre keeps uh, Saul's evil spirits mm -hmm. that's subdued, true. quieted. Yeah. But that's not the same thing as an exorcism or a deliverance. That's true. But you see that all over the New Testament. Hmm. So why is that? So we're going to discuss that next time for our February program. Well, it's a good topic because uh, the, well... The world, I'll put that in, you know, in, in uh, W, capital W, the those who do not know Christ and do not want to know Christ, um, they're fascinated by angels. Mm -hmm. Except the way many of these angel movies and TV shows uh, pitch the plot is that the Lord doesn't care anymore. Right. And so the, the angels are now defending. They're at war with one another because some are defending uh, mankind and some are defending uh, the, the, the absent creator. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, they end up with fiefdoms where nobody's really loyal to the absent creator. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it's a rebranding of the fallen realm, saying that some of them are white magic and some of them are black magic. Mm-hmm. Choose this day whom you will serve. But the choices they give you are not, yeah, neither one is correct. Neither one is correct. Yeah. It's a false paradigm. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, well, in, on PID Radio, about uh, horror fiction and why so much in the way of horror, um, in the horror genre in mm -hmm. movies and in fiction, removes God from the equation. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the supernatural realm exists, but it's all evil. Yeah, the solution is human reason, reason yeah. and human wit. More, I can outwit them. More guns. Dynamite. No. No, none of that works. Wrong, wrong. Uh, none yeah. of that works. Not when you're up against the fallen realm. You, mm. you need to, uh, well, first of all, you need the Holy Spirit. Amen. So anyway, that's uh, tonight. That'll be released at 7 p.m. Central Time at uh, VFTB.net. Also our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gilbert House, if you want to watch it instead. Also on our app. Just get our app. Mm -hmm. Our app has all the of our stuff. The app is the yes. easiest way to keep up with everything we do. It is free, and uh, we've got all of our stuff there, including calendar of upcoming events, calendar of our reading schedule, and uh, more. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Father, thank you for bringing us together over your word today. And again, we lift up the... Uh, the Heiser family, Mike, Drina, their children. Mike, we know, is prepared and is excited to see the um, to see the gathering that awaits him. Having talked to Mike for years, we know his parents are there, and uh, what that reunion looks like, we don't know. We will see someday when we see our parents again. Mm -hmm. 
But Mike has prepared just a very emotional time right now as uh, friends, colleagues, coworkers, family members who've known him for years are uh, saying goodbye. But again, we see him at peace and the, the dignity and the grace that he displays is a testament to your power and your glory and your victory over death. So Lord, we pray for your blessing on Mike and Drina and their family. And we pray, Father, that your spirit would give us such grace when our time finally comes. Lord, we pray for your spirit to guide us all and grant us wisdom and discernment as we take the work that he has shared with us, the wisdom with which you've blessed him, and share that with the world around us. And we know as we see the reaction to Tony Dungy in the press this week and the stories from the United Kingdom of people praying silently who are arrested. The world will not react well. But Lord, just help us to remember, it is not us that they hate or fear, it is you. And if we are counted worthy to suffer for your name, though we don't try to provoke the anger or the reaction of the world, If it comes for speaking the truth with gentleness and respect, then, Lord, we pray for the strength to endure and endure with grace. We thank you, Father, for the gifts with which you've blessed us, and we pray for the wisdom to use them to honor and glorify you each and every day. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.